Hey there YouTube, this is Robert back with another episode of EOI Review. Everything you need to know to pass that despicable end of instruction US history test. In the last video I introduced the three primary tribes of the Great Plains we're going to be dealing with in this section. And this one here is just called Conflict on the Plains. So this one's kind of looking at the various different uh, battles and engagements and sufferings that took place in order for the central part of the United States of America to get settled. So first and foremost we're going to be talking about the Great Plains. What exactly are we talking about? It's this little splatter on the map that looks like someone spilled some uh, ketchup or barbecue sauce across the middle of the map of the United States. But these tribes are talking about this was the area they inhabited. They'd lived there for thousands of years, uh, you know, following the buffalo back and forth up this corridor. So we're talking about 1,988 miles, about 1,988 miles in length. The width is about 497. And I didn't edit this just in case any of those rabid English fans that I have who just are obsessed with American history. Okay, those people don't exist, but uh, 800 kilometers or 497 miles. We're talking about an area of roughly 500,000 square miles. So this is a lot of territory that's going to have to be settled. Now, as of 1834, the U.S. government at the time was actually treating the entire Great Plains of the United States as if it were one giant Native American Indian Reservation. They're just like, oh yeah, they're there, and of course we were just interested in the East Coast, and then of course later we get California, and the Mexican War takes place, you know, the California Gold Rush, all of that, people just kind of wanted to go over the middle of part of the country because it was kind of seen as the Savage Plains. It was uninhabitable land that you couldn't really farm. So people kind of went through on the Oregon Trail and stuff like that. They would have some contact with these Native American tribes, but people really didn't care about the central part of the country. But later, we're talking, you know, Homestead Act, stuff like that, when Lincoln really got serious about settling the central part of what is today the United States. He's like, you know, there's value there. So the government's like, okay, they're going to go out and they're going to start making treaties with these various tribes. And the way this typically worked is you would get a couple of chiefs from a tribe to sign an agreement. But as we'll see later, it wasn't always all of them. Uh, and, you know, if one or two chiefs signed, you realize these, they had different clans that had different chiefs. And just because you got a couple of Sioux chiefs to sign an agreement or agree to an agreement and put their X on there, uh, it didn't necessarily mean all of the tribe was in favor of that, but more on that later for sure. And, of course, most of the members of the tribes are going to ignore these treaties and as the miners and the settlers and people trying to cross through there are going to start passing on to Sioux territory and you know, coming into contact with these other tribes, it's going to create clashes. And these clashes are going to be very frequent and it's going to encompass about a 50-year period of U.S. history where violence on the Great Plains was fairly common. So, the Homestead Act. Now, we've mentioned this before in previous sections. This was in 1862. Lincoln signed this saying, we want people out there. So what they would do is they'd give you, if you were eligible head of a household, they would give you a grant that basically said, okay, you've got 160 acres, because he really wanted people settling this part of the country. Now, I would like to go off on tangents about each one of these things and just talk about them like in detail, but I have to remind myself that's not what we're doing here. We're just going to look at these very quickly, kind of the stuff you really need to know. So the first one we're going to look at is the Sand Creek Massacre. This, of course, is going to take place in Colorado. And they were having trouble, this is like during the Civil War, and they were having trouble with some of these uh, tribes. And it wasn't necessarily the whole tribe. Like, if you were attacked by a group of Cheyenne warriors, it didn't mean the entire Cheyenne tribe was at war with you. Now, the U.S. government's going to view it that way. But like I said, these little bands of warriors would kind of go together and they would ride off on raiding parties and stuff like that. And it's going to create a problem because chiefs, you know, like even 
Black Kettle and Sitting Bull and some of these chiefs we're going to talk about in this lesson could not necessarily control all of their young warriors. And they would follow different, uh, you know, chiefs and war, I don't even know if you call them war chiefs, but just uh, warriors who basically were highly respected and sometimes they would just leave and go off and do something and you couldn't necessarily control them. So this had been going on a lot in the Colorado area and of course gold is at the root of this. People were encroaching on Cheyenne lands because, you know, there was gold to be had out there. So they're like, we're going to go get striking it rich. Now, they had to have considered, well, you know, we could be attacked by these people, but it started happening fairly often. So, of course, the U.S. Army is going to be notified, hey, you know, they're on the war path out here. Come protect us. So there's a General S.R. Curtis who is quoted as saying, I want no peace until the Indians suffer more. So, like, we need to make sure we fight full-scale engagements. We need to make sure we inflict a lot of pain on them. Therefore, we have a lot of bargaining power and we get a better deal out of it. That's kind of what's going on. So, he's going to send a colonel by the name of John Chivington with 700 soldiers out there. I want you to realize, you know, if the Civil War is going on, these soldiers that are out here, you know, these are soldiers that are not fighting the Confederacy. So it kind of makes you wonder what kind of soldiers they were. Were these just frontier soldiers? I don't really know. I don't want to read more into this than maybe should be read into it. Because basically this is called a massacre for a reason. But anyway, they ride up on this camp and they attack them and they kill 150 Cheyenne and Arapaho. And kind of as is the case here, these aren't necessarily 150 warriors they're killing. You know, we're talking elderly women and children. And the second thing you really need to know what it is, is the Treaty of Fort Laramie. Now the Cheyenne, they were kind of a cousin tribe of the Sioux, and the Cheyenne kind of have this long history of getting attacked, just like what I imagined, just like what I described here, and what you imagined in your mind if you're using that wonderful imagination of yours. You know, they're going to get attacked a lot. And you got people like Black Kettle who would survive one massacre, and then try to be really friendly with the United States and cooperate with them and everything else and go exactly where he's told to do. But it seems like this, this tragedy, the string of tragedy, just follows uh, some of these people. Now, the larger, more powerful tribe to the north is the Sioux. And there's this Bosman Trail, kind of you can see here on this map, runs right through their territory about 1866, 1868. And you can notice all the forts that are built along this trail. And this, of course, to protect the miners and the settlers, you know, the white settlers and miners who are going out there looking for gold or strike it rich or settle land or whatever. But they're surrounded by all these tribes. So they bring together some, and I want to emphasize, some chiefs to negotiate. And like I said, from the U.S. government perspective, you get a couple of these chiefs to sign. You're like, okay, we're good. We've got it. We've got their agreement. We can hold it. Hold them to it. So, several chiefs did not like the fact that these trails ran through their territories. You can imagine it's going to disrupt everything in their way of life and their migratory patterns and stuff. They're like, we really don't want you crossing over our land, you know, this kind of sucks. So what they did is they said, oh, well, we'll try to pressure some of them. So like, Red Cloud's like, dude, this isn't cool. You know, our people are so, and conflict's bound to happen. They're encroaching on our territory and, of course, we're going to try to defend it, and we don't like what's going on here. So, what happens is some of these warriors go on what you would call the war path, I guess, and they attack a group of soldiers. And this is called the Fetterman Massacre, and about 80 soldiers were killed. Now, the Sioux always had a cooler name for, like, these engagements. They called it the Battle of the Hundred Slain. Like, we're going to leave no doubt in your mind what happened here. They came into our territory and we slayed and buried a hundred of them. So after this, of course, the U.S. government's going to have to intervene. They're going to have to do something. So what happens is they get some of these chiefs to agree to move to a reservation. Now, notice there I said, some. And they would always say, oh, now the whole tribe has to do it, because see, we got some chiefs. But it wasn't like the President of the United States is Commander-in-Chief, and if he says it, like, everyone has to abide by it. Like I said in previous videos, these tribes, they had clans, they had family groupings and stuff, and you could choose to follow whoever. So just because 
This chief says, oh yeah, that's cool, we'll abide by it. That doesn't mean the whole tribe. That the U.S. government was always like, yeah, the whole Sioux, they're going to stay on this reservation. Sitting Bull, that guy right there, did not sign it. And that is very, very, very important. And it's going to come into play later in this lesson. He's like, nope, not going to do it. He wanted nothing to do with it. So his people, the people who followed him, you know, they have not agreed to stay on a reservation. That You have to make that very clear because it wasn't necessarily clear to U.S. Army commanders at the time. So we jump back down south. All this stuff's going on at the same time. You kind of have to realize this can get kind of confusing. I realize maybe I could have organized this a little better, but the Red River Wars happened further south. Now here we're talking about the Comanche and the Kiowa. Now these are the tribes of the southern plains. And about 1874-1875, Quanta Parker and some other chiefs basically go on, again, the war path. And this is going on in the Texas Panhandle, just west of what's called Indian Territory. And I call it Indian Territory because they wanted to stick all of the tribes from across the country here in what is today Oklahoma and say, stay here. But the conditions and stuff weren't always good. They couldn't always get enough food. Plus, these are tribal, you know, Indian tribes. They don't want, they want to go up and down the plains and hunt the buffalo and all of this stuff. And in what they consider their territory... Uh, these guys start attacking white settlements. And typically what they would do is they would come in, they would steal your cattle, uh, you know, steal horses. Sometimes they would kill these settlers. Sometimes they would kidnap the women and take them to go join their tribes and stuff. So, Philip Sheridan, who's in charge of the U.S. Army at this point in time, and in charge of controlling all of this, this is Philip Sheridan. Now, some people disagree about whether or not he said this. But he did, and I don't even like saying it, but this is kind of what you need to associate with Philip Sheridan. Uh, he was quoted as saying, the only good end in is a dead end in. That was kind of his mentality. You got to remember this is a Civil War veteran, the guy who crushed and starved Lee's army to bring the war to an end. He basically is a very effective general. Now his methods, you may not agree with them, but he is going to send U.S. soldiers out here to battle the Kiowa under the leadership of Lone Wolf. Yes, Lone Wolf. There is a town very near where I live named Lone Wolf. And one of my favorites, Quanta Parker of the Comanche. Now, people just feared the Comanche. You know, they were great warriors. And these guys went out and basically started attacking all of these settlements. And there was a lot of death and chaos. So, Philip Sheridan's like, go out there and take care of them and squelch them. Now, what happens is, this is a winter campaign. And the reason Philip Sheridan did this in the winter, this was very unusual, but he's like, if we can take their food and kill enough war ponies, uh, we can basically force them onto the reservation. In other words, if we try to do this in the summer when the weather's nice and food is plentiful, uh, it's gonna, we're going to have a harder time. So yeah, the soldiers had to suffer, but the tribal members who were following these chiefs had to suffer a lot because this was devastating warfare. I mean, this was killing out all their food supplies, going out, shooting all the bison in the area, like I said, trying to shoot their horses, take their, because, uh, you know, they'd have camps, they have to move everything, and if you could still, you know, it would be their equivalent of a wagon train. They usually pulled the stuff behind horses, but destroy their homes, destroy their way of life, you will force them back to Fort Sill. And that's eventually what happens, you know, near what, it's basically in what is today lot in Oklahoma, but you have to realize, every single one of these incidents, you know, that's going to get in the media, people are going to be saying, it's going to just, this image of, oh, there are a bunch of savages living on the plains, it's just going to be intensified. And each one of these encounters is going to become more vicious and violent. And, of course, the big one uh, near where I live is the Battle of the Washita. Now, this is George Armstrong Custer. Now, George Armstrong Custer got himself in trouble with the U.S. Army, got demoted, basically got... I don't want to say kicked out of the military, but suspended, I guess would be a good word, for a year. Basically because he left his men to go off and have a little love session with his wife and his brutal treatment of soldiers. His soldiers could not stand him. And he's basically a guy with the big ego. Just so you know, he's the most photographed man of the entire 19th century. There's more pictures of George Armstrong Custer than there are of Lincoln. He, like, had his own photographer who followed him around and took pictures of him all the time. 
And he kind of had vision. He wanted big political power and all this stuff. And he thought, the way I get that is glory. You know, go out and win great victories for the United States. People will be talking about me. I'll get my name in the newspapers. You know, worked for Grant. That's how he got to be president. So Custer's a guy with a tremendous ego. And it's kind of sad here because, you know, because some of the Cheyenne who survived the Sand Creek Massacre earlier, you know, they're following Black Kettle. And this is a peaceful group of Cheyenne Indians. This is a group that's been given a flag by the United States officer, you know, nearby, because uh, there were forts all over what is today called Indian Territory. And, you know, the commanding generals, they've given him this promise, they've given him this flag, says, as long as you're flying this flag, you will not be attacked. And he's basically out here on Indian Reservation land. I mean, this is a peaceful village. They're on Indian Reservation land exactly where they're supposed to be. But here's the problem. Some Cheyenne and Kiowa had been leaving, and they'd been going out on raiding parties, attacking settlers, and stealing livestock, and kidnapping women, and doing all of this stuff. So Sheridan calls Custer out of his exile and says, I need you to go take care of this. Now, this is very bad because you're bringing this guy back, and he's like, I have to make a splash. I have to do something. So he doesn't do any scouting. He doesn't go out and figure out, hey, is this the right group of Indians I'm getting ready to go and attack or not? He's just going to go do it. And again, you'll see this is in November of 1878. This is not when you would really think there's going to be large military campaigns and battles and stuff like that. And there were a string of Cheyenne, Arapaho, Kiowa villages along the Washita River. And Black Kettle sitting there with his wife and his hundreds of followers. And they, of course, get reports from neighboring Kiowa. They're like, hey, you know, uh, the blue coats are in this area. You know, be out on alert. And a lot of these guys are coming back from raiding parties. And they're spotted very near the village. And Black Kettle's wife is like, we need to get out of here, get closer to the Kiowa. This is kind of dangerous. But Black Kettle's thinking, hey, I've got this flag. I've got this promise. Just earlier in the week, he had met the commanding U.S. officer in this region and like everything was going to be okay. But the problem is, you know, this guy, basically, he's outranked by Sheridan. And Custer's not going to listen to anybody because Custer's kind of an arrogant jerk. So Custer goes riding in that night, surrounds the village. Black Kettle's wife begs him to leave. She says, I just got a bad feeling about this. He's like, no, man, it, we've been promised. We've done nothing wrong. It wasn't our guys doing all of this stuff. So they go to sleep. And, of course, Custer becomes famous for his early morning attacks in the pre-dawn hours, you know, right when the sun's getting ready to come up. His band would play Gary Owen, and they'd go charging in there with their pistols and sabers drawn. And this is just an absolute slaughter. A hundred and two, at least. And the numbers on these you can never really quite be sure about. A hundred and two Cheyenne are killed. A very small number of these are warriors. A few of the warriors do manage to escape and go hide in the brush and basically return some fire. Several hundreds run and scatter in different directions. And Custer's men literally just chase them down and cut them to pieces. And unfortunately, Black Kettle and his wife are both killed. They get on a horse and they try to ride away. They're chased down and both of them are shot through the back. And Custer's like, yeah. And here's a small group of the survivors that they take up into Kansas and basically imprison them in a fort. I said, this, was, this could be not called nothing other than a massacre. It was a peaceful village. And this type of stuff happens with fairly alarming regularity during this era. So back up to the north you've got Sioux tribal lands. Now just like in Colorado, like I said, they discover some gold up in the mountains. You cannot keep the people out. It doesn't matter what you do. They're like, hey, there's gold there. And in fact, there's a quote from Custer himself. It's like he wanted to bring this on. He's like, there's gold from the grassroots down. Just come on in, you know, because he's the guy that's tasked with keeping control of these tribes. And a guy like him, he wants nothing more than that thrill of battle. I mean, he just wants to go out there and make an egg, get his name in the papers. That's what he wants to do. And the Sioux and the Cheyenne and the Arapaho are all going to appeal because the Black Hills are their sacred ground. That's where their ancestors are buried. That's where their origins of the tribe stories, you know, go back to. That's the roots. That's their sacred ground. And they don't want people running all over it. 
And there's enough warriors there who are going to defend what is theirs that a clash is imminent. But you got to remember, Custer's a guy. He'd attacked these tribes before. After they signed a treaty, he would get them to sign another treaty. And, of course, he would break it. And he would get them to sign another treaty. He would break it. And the last time this happened, uh, some of the Sioux chiefs basically looked at him and said, you know, if you break your word to us again, we will kill you. And, of course, he thought it was funny. He laughed when they said this to him. So it's kind of odd the way the rest of this stuff plays out because you got the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Now, I've got an entire lesson just about the Battle of the Little Bighorn, and I'm really going to want to go off on this one, and I really cannot because I see the videos getting long already. But I guess the long story short, Sitting Bull, the chief of those who wished Jerome free, he was elected that, and all of the Sioux who did not want to stay on that reservation since U.S. government wasn't keeping its word, well, why should we? And, of course, they go out, and they're basically marching towards Canada. And, of course, any time any of these tribes left the reservation, well, the war bell was sounded, oh, go get them and drag them back, go get them and drag them back. And, of course, this is going to be George Armstrong Custer that's going to have to do this. So he takes his 7th Cavalry out there to pull them back in. I don't really understand why well, I do. This was about control. But if they're trying to leave the country, you know, who cares? But, no, this is about, we told you to stay there, and by golly, you're going to stay there. So he goes out there with the 7th Cavalry. Now, I had three different detachments of Cavalry, but his was the 7th Cavalry. Major Benteen and some of them other, he divides his forces. And just before this battle happened, Sitting Bull basically did a uh, dance. You know, he cut like a hundred strips of flesh from his body and did a dance like a day and a night and into the next day and he came back out of it and he said I had a vision and I saw hundreds of soldiers basically falling from their horses falling from the sky you know like grasshoppers falling from the sky and of course his warriors take this as a very positive sign that oh yes we're going to slaughter these guys so Custer basically wanted to go off and win this battle with like 268 men and he had no idea, no idea, because what he did at the Battle of the Washington was he just rode in and attacked them. No scouting of how many are here, we have no idea. And it worked, because there, there were only a few hundred. But here, you know, Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse had thousands of warriors. We're talking three to 4,000 warriors. And if I were really going into detail, de detail here, which I'm not, let's just say they were very well armed for various reasons. And... Custer's men, you know, they threw away everything like their sabers because they wanted to travel light. And they just go riding in there, and he's going to do the exact same thing. And he charges into what he thinks is the flank of the village. But there's teepees and stuff as far as the eye can see. And someone is actually knocking at my door. I don't get visitors very often. So, yes, that was interesting. So, Sitting Bull's vision, his... Men are like, yeah, we're ready to go. Custer has no idea. So he storms in there, and they're completely surrounded by warriors closing in on them on all sides. And the massacre is completely total. Crazy Horse and his warriors are going to destroy Custer and his entire command. And I'm not just talking about, like, run them off the battlefield. I'm talking, like, killed every single one of them. This was the biggest, most total victory that the Plains Indians warriors ever had over the United States military. And of course they go in, cut off his fingertip and take their sewing awls and gouge out his eardrums so he can hear better in his next life. And Custer's just gone. No more. So whatever political ambitions or whatever this guy actually had, it's over. The problem is this is a war that the Sioux just cannot win. The U.S. government's too big, they got too many soldiers, too many weapons, too much resources, and there's just too many people flooding in on their land. So they're going to get forced on reservations. And Sitting Bull, they're going to take him and parading around in the Wild West shows, and ooh, this is Sitting Bull, and all this stuff. You know, people pay a quarter to come in and see the show and see the great Sioux chief. Crazy Horse is going to be put in custody, and when he, of course, tries to break away, they kill him, bayonet through the back. So, 
Sitting Bull is basically paraded around, they take him and they put him on this reservation. But by this point, nearly all of the Plains tribes have been confined to just this horrible life on these tiny little slithers of land, and they're not satisfied by it. And you can imagine how depressing this must have been, particularly for the older uh, members of the tribe who basically saw the heyday, the glory days of these tribes. And they're basically seeing their way of life die. So, people just start thinking, you know, you, when there's no other hope out there, you know, you're completely defeated, conquered, confined, people start thinking, if there was anything we could do, we'd be willing to do it. So, there is a Paiute, Paiute, uh, he's basically a medicine man, and on the Paiute reservation, uh, he basically starts this movement called the Ghost Dance. Now, the Ghost Dance, uh, his name's Waboka. And it's basically just like if we can get all of the Native Americans together and they can all believe and they return to their cultural roots and we dance and we dance and we dance and we hope, you know, effectively praying because it's like the last ditch hope that they have. And they're like, we can just get together and we all believe and we dance and we dance and we dance. Maybe. Or not, I shouldn't say maybe. I mean, because he said it will all come back. The white man will be pushed back into the sea. All the brave warriors who have died fighting them will return to us. All of our great chiefs will return if we all believe. So this starts spreading all across these reservations. There are about 25,000 people on the Sioux Reservation. Now if you were an Indian agent out there, you know, someone with the Bureau of Indian Affairs who's supposed to be keeping an eye on them, and this movement starts to spread, and they start to dance and dance, and they believe it. And you start hearing some of the murmurings of what they're saying. You start getting pretty nervous. And he's basically calling, he's like, hey, you know, on the telegraph, like, these guys are getting ready to go on the warpath. And there's not enough people here to control them. So they start thinking, well, if we take out Sitting Bull, we can confine the Sioux. So Indian agents, many of these Native Americans themselves, uh, come in to arrest Sitting Bull. And they come in like 5.30 in the morning, you know, and they come through the front door and they're like, Sitting Bull, you're coming with us. And they were arresting him in the wee morning hours so there wouldn't be any trouble or resistance. But, you know, this is going to cause a commotion. So Sitting Bull's kind of taking his time, you know, they were, oh, we put him in a wagon on a horse, having all these debates. So they said, we're going to put him on a horse and ride him out of there. And he refuses to get on the horse. And of course, the more sound and commotion, the more people start waking up and coming out to see what's going on. And when they were trying to get him on the horse, he refused. Someone comes in and basically shoots one of, he was a, an Indian agent who was Native American, shoots him, and one of the officers responds by shooting Sitting Bull in the chest and killing him instantly. And of course, by this point, the Sioux are enraged. And it's basically like turning into a riot. And that's how Sitting Bull dies. So he's dead, Black Kettle's dead, uh, Crazy Horse is dead. You're kind of noticing a pattern here. Well, that sets up Wounded Knee, which was the last tragic act of the Plains Indians War. Basically, there's another chief named Bigfoot who basically takes a large number of Sioux and he's like, we're leaving. This sucks. And again, they're going to try to do that whole escaping the U.S. government authority thing. And of course, the U.S. government's going to say, no, you're going to obey us. We told you to stay here. You're staying here. So in either they wanted this to happen or that you can put that you can categorize this like in the worst decisions ever made in the history of decision making when it comes to this theater. It's like we're going to send the 7th Calvary to go bring the Sioux back. Remember, the Sioux were the tribe that killed Custer, and his entire command of the 7th Cavalry was wiped out. So this is the same unit, obviously. I mean, you can see the date here. We're talking this is like 14 years later, but they know the history of their unit and what happened to them, and they know what tribe did this to them. So there's really no love loss here at all. So they're like, we're going to go, and we're going to hunt down the Sioux, and we're going to bring them back. So what happens is they round up several hundred starving, freezing Sioux uh, 
tribal members, and we're up here, I mean, this is the far north, we're talking, you know, the Dakotas, Montana, Wyoming in the winter time, where all this stuff's playing out. They're like rounding them up and they're like, okay, you know, confine them. They put cannons up on hills around them and they're like, we're going to march you guys through here and we're going to disarm all of you. And there was one aged, you know, elderly member of the Sioux tribe that had a gun that he didn't want to give up. And, you know, he said, I paid a lot of money for this. It's not yours. You have no right to take it. And they're like, yeah, we're going to disarm all of you because we want no problems with you. And he just, he didn't want to do it. And, of course, this is the last act of violence on the plains between these two groups. So there's a lot more than just the Sioux surrendering here. You know, the disarm, there's a lot of symbolism going on here. The helplessness of their situation, everything they've been through, the fact that it's an old Sioux guy, again, you know, who's seen all of this stuff happen. You know, and here it is, like the last gun we have, and you're trying to rip it out of our arms, and he doesn't want to do it. So you got this young member of the 7th Cavalry, like, yeah, and, you know, hitting him, pushing him, yanking the gun away. Gun goes off. A gun. There's a lot of discrepancy, and people say, oh, it was a Sioux gun, oh, it was a happy trigger finger with some member of the 7th Cavalry. We don't know. But we do know that the 7th Cavalry just opens fire on this group of unarmed people just lined up like this is a shooting range. And actually a lot of the members of the 7th Cavalry who were trying to disarm the Sioux were actually hit by their own fire. But they basically had these artillery pieces up here just firing into them like in the cross line. Like, you can't over miss, you can't under miss because there's a the line. Your shot goes over, you still hit somebody, your shot goes under. They had some of these repeating, rapid-firing weapons, and they just mowed down these people. So they go running and scattering in all the different directions, and again, they're going to be chased down and slaughtered. And the fact that this is the 7th Cavalry, kind of, you can see how this happened and why this happened. Uh, so 350 are killed, uh, and here, I mean, this is a tragic, tragic, tragic picture. Uh, you got Chief Bigfoot himself laying there in the snow. And it's, like I said, it's not just the Sioux being subdued here. It's an entire way of life. It's an entire culture that is wiped away here. And 20 soldiers from this engagement, which really isn't a battle. I mean, today we call it the Wounded Knee Massacre. I mean, that's what it's called. 20 soldiers were given the Medal of Honor for their service here. You're basically shooting down old men and old women and children. And very few of the Sioux were even armed at all. 20 soldiers were given the Medal of Honor for this battle. Now, we'll kind of end this. I could say my spill here, but there probably is no better way to end this lesson than letting someone who was there, who witnessed it, speak. This is from a book called Black Elk Speaks. I did not know how much was ended. When I looked back, I wish that I had died there too. I can still see the butchered women and children lying, heaped and scattered along the crooked gulch. And I can see that something else died there in the bloody mud and was buried in the blizzard. A people's dream died there. It was a beautiful dream.